Welcome everyone. If you've just joined us, we're going to wait for a few more attendees to uh, join the webinar and we'll be starting at five past the hour. Welcome everyone, if you've just joined us uh, to the event Rewiring Law to Fight Climate Change. We're just waiting for a few more attendees and we'll start at five past the hour. Um, this is a test for your audio. If you can't hear us now, please do um, make sure that you've got that uh, ahead of five past the hour. Welcome everyone. If you've just joined us, we're starting the event Rewiring Law to Fight Climate Change at five past the hour. So you can test your audio now and we'll be starting in one moment. Good morning in New York, good afternoon in London and Europe, and good evening in Asia. I'm Ellie Mulholland, the director of the nonprofit CCLI, a senior associate specialising in climate risk governance at law firm Minter Ellison, and a quant team member for the Chancery Lane Project. I'll be your host for today's New York Climate Week event, Rewiring Law to Fight Climate Change. Now there is overwhelming consensus that human activities such as the burning of fossil fuel, land clearing and agriculture contribute significant volumes of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And according to the IPCC, which is the gold standard for climate science, the release of excess greenhouse gas emissions attributable to these human activities have already caused approximately one degree of global warming above average pre-industrial temperatures. And this human-induced climate change is already having a profound effect across the world. But we have a roadmap for solutions with the Paris Agreement, where the world's governments have agreed to transition to net zero emissions and limit warming to well below two degrees and to strive for 1.5 degrees to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. And that means we need to halve emissions in the next decade and this will require systems transitions in energy, land use, industrials, transport, and how we produce and consume, and how we practice law. Our clients want lawyers who can help them navigate the disruptions from climate change and achieve their climate goals. So what can New York and US lawyers do? 
Well, today our panelists are here to share with you how they use their legal expertise to address climate change and how you can collaborate with us at the Chancery Land Project. We're also la launching the third edition of the Climate Contract Playbook. Um, some precedent lawyers that lawyers can freely use in their drafting with their clients to, for climate solutions. And at the end, we'll close by launching a four month program of events designed to facilitate continued drafting of precedent clauses, their increased use with clients and their translation into multiple jurisdictions. So we've got a lot on. But first, some housekeeping. Attendees, please submit questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, please note this webinar will be recorded, including the discussion and Q&A portion of the event, meaning that you'll be very much encouraged to submit questions, but your name and question will be visible when you do in the recording. We would also encourage you to engage in the discussion using the chat function. So let us know that you can hear us, let us know where you're joining us from, and let us know how, uh, that you're interested in getting involved. And now to introduce you to our panellists. These days it is trite to say that a panel is esteemed, but when you look at the speakers that we have today, giving generously their time and expertise, you know that we're dealing with an important existential issue. We have Lord Robert Carnwith, a former UK Supreme Court judge and the honorary president of the UK Environmental Law Association. We have Deborah Smith, the co-founder of the UK in-house pro bono group and senior counsel at Goldman Sachs. We have Professor Michael Gerard, the founder and director of the Sabin Center uh, for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School with you in New York. We have Kathy DeFilia, the VP of US Practical Law Editorial, also based in New York. We have Yasmin Walji, the International Pro Bono Director for Hogan Lovells, based here in London. And Matthew Gingell, the Chair of the Chancery Lane Project and General Counsel at Oxygen House Group. So without further ado, I will turn over to Lord Carnworth uh, to ask him to set the scene on climate and the law with some introductory remarks. Thank you, Ellie, and hello everyone. I'm delighted and honoured to be asked to uh, participate in this important event in New York Climate Week um, with the Chancery Lane Project and other eminent speakers. Um, for those who don't know London or haven't read their Dickens, Chancery Lane is at the heart of legal London and in a sense of the common law world, I suppose. Um, the, in any event, this project is about promoting the contribution of lawyers in combating climate change. Uh, and the emphasis is on the common law world. And of course, um, America is a vital and thriving part of that world. But it ties in with a call to action by lawyers in all jurisdictions made by the International Bar Association in their climate crisis statement in May of this year. Now, as a justice of the UK Supreme Court, I have attempted over some years to um, take an active part in promoting the role of the law in climate change. In 2015, ahead of the Paris summit, which led to the vital Paris Agreement, uh, I hosted uh, a conference in London with the support of the government and um, of the Supreme Court on climate change and the law. And we had a very valuable discussion about the way in which the law could contribute. But much has happened since then in all respects, but uh, the role of lawyers has become more and more into focus. And certainly now I'm retired, I retired in March. Um, I want to play a, a part in ensuring that the role of the law and of lawyers and of judges is at the heart of the discussions leading to the uh, postponed COP26 event, which the UK are uh, hosting in November next year. Now, central to that discussion, of course, is um, having strong frameworks of legislation. In the UK, we have the Climate Change Act of 2008, which I think has proved to be something of a world leader but there's been a lot of legislative activity around the world since then, and it'll be 
important and useful to compare the effectiveness of those. And I look forward to hearing it shortly to my good friend Michael Gerard talking about his pioneering work on legal pathways to decarbonisation. Um, we also need to look at the role of litigation, what are the effective routes to ensure that the courts are able to enforce either the legislation or constitutional guarantees of the environment. We've had plenty of cases. Recently, we've had a very important decision of the Irish Supreme Court about the duties of government in preparing plans. And currently, I think there is before the Brazilian Supreme Court a very significant and interesting case about climate change as it affects that country. So that is going to be a very important part of the discussion. But judges, however creative, um, must ultimately work within the limits of the legal toolbox made available to them by their particular systems. Now the Chancery Lane project, I think, has a rather different focus. It's not so much about legislation or litigation as such, but about the contracts which are central to all um, commercial legal arrangements. Now, for too long, the role of commercial law lawyers to help tackle the climate crisis has been largely overlooked. Lawyers draft the contracts that shape the economic relationships of our society, and lawyers must use these arrangements to enable rather than hinder the transition. I've been fascinated to follow the work of the Chancellor Lane project and to see how they've developed their what now is to be the third edition of precedents, because they show us how the mechanisms um, are within for to make these um, legal provisions are within our reach. It shows us what can be achieved when uh, lawyers come together as a profession and use the uh, power of pro bono work to focus on practical solutions to the climate crisis. So I add my encouragement to lawyers and businesses to use whenever practical the body of contractual clauses which you'll be hearing about uh, in the course of this seminar those which have already been drafted. But we also, I think, are looking to lawyers everywhere to help promote those clauses, to test their effectiveness in practice, and to see how we can build on that in different jurisdictions. Now, we are, as we all know, at a pivotal moment. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the fragility of our economic social systems, but has also shown that we have an immense opportunity to improve things, to build a green movement for um, economic rebirth from COVID. And there's no doubt that there's a strong momentum building globally. So as more and more businesses embrace the move to the objective of net zero emissions, um, in-house and private practice lawyers have an opportunity to show that integrating climate solutions into contracts will be a key to that journey. So I wish the project well and I look forward to hearing the contributions of the coming speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Conworth. You've really set the scene there with um, recognising the role of lawyers to they can hinder the transition or they can really enable this transition. And um, at that point, I'd like to bring in um, the founder and chair of the Chancery Lane Project, Matthew Gimjol. And Matt, we, led, we met in July last year at London Climate Action Week, where we were having conversations around this exact conversation, hindering or enabling the transition. And on the train on the way home, you had a brainwave about how lawyers can enable the transition. Um, and get involved in climate solutions. So I'd like to invite you now to um, share your brainwave, which is the Chancery Lane Project, and uh, launch the next editions of the Playbook and Glossary. Yes, thank you, Ellie, and good morning, New York. Uh, as Ellie has uh, introduced me, my name's Matt, and before we start, I've got a confession to make to you all. I am not an environmental lawyer, 
and I work for a profit-making company. I'm simply an in-house commercial lawyer with a purpose to make a difference on climate change. But enough about me, what is the Chancery Lane project I hear you say? Well, as Ellie was saying, um, the project's genesis has a strong connection with New York already, because at one of the events during that London Climate Action Week uh, event that Ellie was talking about, ocean explorer Penn Haddo finished that talk by saying, we need a Manhattan project for climate change. Now he did not mean that we need to create new weapons of mass destruction, but his analogy was sound. We need the focus and urgency of a Manhattan project using the best and brightest minds to solve the issue of the day, which is climate change. So on that train journey home, I started thinking, what could the legal profession do? How could we collaborate and innovate in ways that produce practical climate solutions? How could we use our commercial legal skills in a politically and professionally neutral way to make a difference? What if we convened a, a diverse range of bright legal minds to focus on combating climate change? Could we change that dynamic from the talking to the doing? A few weeks later, the Chancery Lane project became the code name for the idea to convene the best and brightest legal minds to create the laws and contracts required to fight climate change. And as Lord Carnworth has pointed out, the name refers to that section of, of road in, uh, in London where the traditional seat of UK law was, was born. Our vision is simple at the Chancery Lane Project, a world where every contract and law enables solutions to climate change. Our purpose is therefore to help create those practical legal solutions using collaborative problem solving. In effect, we rewire contracts and laws today to create new market norms for lawyers and lawmakers to use. Well, that sounds like a really ambitious vision, I'm sure you say. So how do we achieve that? Well, we set ourselves four clear goals. And the first goal is to convene, as we are today, and inspire a diverse range of lawyers from across the profession to focus on climate change. We started with a physical legal hackathon last November, and there's some pictures there. But like everybody else in the world, we've had to pivot to a virtual uh, system, and now we have significant numbers of our participants convening on Slack and Zoom every week. And this is really exciting. But the key to convening is creating this safe space to innovate. It's not our natural habitat as lawyers. And that is why we've always positioned ourselves as politically and professionally neutral, but also aligned with the business of law. Interestingly, and why I started off with my confession of not being an environmental lawyer, is that I am not alone in the project. 95% of our participants do not describe themselves as environmental lawyers. For me, this is the shift change where climate change is becoming mainstream to the business of law. Our second goal in achieving the vision is to co-create and publish the climate contract playbook of precedent clauses, a green paper of model laws, and a glossary of climate change legal definitions. These code of our, our solutions that we co-create for deployment. And I'm delighted at this moment to officially launch the publication of edition three of the climate contract playbook and the second version of the glossary of definitions. These fantastic publications contain the output of a, a virtual hack process we undertook in June and July this year. We have now co-created and published an incredible 50 clauses, 42 definitions and seven model laws in this year. And what you may not know is each one has a name, a child's name, and that child has a relationship with the drafters. And that is how we keep the focus on the next generation for whom the full impact of climate change will be felt. Well, there's so much more to come in terms of uh, drafting as well. And I'm particularly excited about a capital markets edition of the playbook, which is being um, led by in-house lawyers from Bank of America and many others. This is important because as, as uh, Lord Carnworth was saying, money influences and economics influence behavior. So by looking at capital markets and seeing how they can influence climate behavior is really exciting. But why are these publications so important? Well, as Lord Carnworth was saying, lawyers advise every cross sector of society and the economy. We shape the economic relationships of our clients. So businesses wanting to take the lead can use contracts to bridge the gap before legislation requires it. 
Also, contracts will be required for every single part of the transition towards net zero and greener economies. That is new business for the business of law. So the third goal is to disseminate and promote and track the clauses and model laws we create, encouraging all lawyers to amplify their impact by changing precedents and using the drafting. Our publications have been downloaded over 20,000 times from 75 different countries and the reach and potential impact of contracts is incredible. They are not confined to borders like our laws. They can link multinational supply chains and they can happen immediately. They don't take time to be enacted, debated and brought into legislation. They can create a positive outcome from day one. To crudely illustrate that potential, there are 24,000 members of the New York City Bar. If say 10,000 of those attorneys use a climate purposed NDA precedent, say once a week for a year, that would amount to about half a million transactions that had a climate element to them. That's a lot. But then multiply that by the 1.3 million attorneys in the American Bar Association, and you see the potential for change. Changing precedence is therefore a key part of that amplification process. It creates an opt out system rather than an opt in for climate drafting. By having it in the precedent means it's much more likely to form part of the commercial relationship. Our final goal is to work with others to create new market norms, to bring about that change and embed that lasting impact. The theory being that if both sides of a transaction see a precedent with similar drafting, they will see this as the new normal and over time an adopted way of doing business. That drafting then locks in the impact by creating a new starting point for negotiations and expanding the impact of that contractual relationship. So how does this all fit together? Well, the theory is that governments have and will legislate for carbon emissions, but the impact of these laws will take time to come into effect. This is time we don't have if we are to meet the 2030 goals uh, of emissions reductions to keep a 1.5 or 2 degree rise in, in temperatures. Our theory is that the model laws will bring forward the impact of the legislation that's to come and that contracts bridge the gap before that legislation is introduced. In effect, climate contracts and model laws allow impact on climate change to happen sooner in a way that is aligned to business objectives and economic prosperity. That is why the project is here. This is, we believe, a new legal doctrine of ground level commercial contracts driving environmental outcomes. And we want you to help us prove this theory. Well, this all sounds great, um, but we are under no illusion that the laws and contracts we draft through this project will be enough on their own to address climate change. But creating new market norms embedded in precedence will align profit, profession and planet to create a better tomorrow. And both as a lawyer and a father, I'm immensely grateful for the progress this project has made in just 14 short months. The momentum and step change I've seen in the UK is so encouraging. It gives me comfort and optimism for the next generation in whose name we, we draft. Well, there's so much more uh, still to do, and I'll talk a little bit um, more later about how you and your organisation can get involved. But for now, I'll hand back to Ellie and our brilliant next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, on, this, on that slide you were sharing, the, the impact uh, velocity graph and this idea about how contracts can bring that forward. So I think now is the perfect time to bring in Professor Michael Gerard. Um, and particularly, uh, we've, we'd like to hear from Professor Gerard around the legal pathways to deep decarbonisation. And Professor Gerard, I'd like for you if you could tell us about how that project, um, about the project and the way in which model laws like in that project and also the one in which, the ones in which we have with the Chancery Lane project can bring forward climate action. Um, and if you've got some slides as well, please do share those. Thank you very much, Ali. It's a pleasure to join with you and we're very happy to be cooperating with the Chancery Lane project. I'm um, sharing my slides now. Um, and so the project that you have been, uh, can you see the slides now? 
Uh, the, the project you've heard about is on drafting model transactional provisions, contractual provisions. I'm going to tell you briefly about a project on drafting model laws. It started um, about eight years ago under the aegis of, of the UN, the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project uh, looked at 16 major economies and looked at how each of them could transform its energy system uh, to move away from fossil fuels and to radically reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they produced uh, a book for each of these 16 countries. Uh, one, of those, one of them was for the US and the pathways had four basic pillars, decarbonizing the electricity supply, moving entirely away from fossil fuels to generate electricity uh, and instead to use renewables and, and the existing nuclear. The second pillar is energy efficiency, greatly improving the efficiency of the use of energy. The third pathway is electrification of the current uh, uses of, of fossil fuels led by transport. So in time, all of the new passenger vehicles that are manufactured and sold uh, would be electric, possibly some hydrogen, um, uh, heating and cooling and uh, space heating would be uh, transformed to electricity, um, probably using heat pumps and some other technologies. And so there would be a tremendous increase in electricity demand but if that electricity is supplied by clean sources, then we're where we need to be. And finally, carbon capture, capturing the CO2 that is emitted uh, from uh, uh, any remaining fossil fuel plants and certain industrial operations before it gets into the ground and removing uh, a lot of the CO2 that is, um, that is now in the atmosphere. Uh, so after that book came out, another law, law professor, John Dernbach, and I asked the question, how does U.S. law need to change in order for the U.S. to be on this pathway? So we uh, put together a team of about 50 lawyers, mostly law professors, but some in private practice, some in NGOs, all of us working pro bono to put together this, this big book, Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States. It's about 1,200 pages. It was published in April of 2019 by the Environmental Law Institute. We also have a more bite-sized uh, abridged version, which is uh, a mere 150 pages and is available for free download. I'll send around uh, the link. And we, we found that there are legal tools that exist uh, or that could be developed that would go a very long way to decarbonize the United States. We came up with more than 1,500 recommendations for federal, state, local, and private action. A wide variety of tools are involved. Most of them are regulatory, uh, but, but many are not. And they would also have uh, side benefits of producing air pollution and creating jobs and lots of other positive impacts. Uh, so there are 35 chapters. Um, each of these bullets is is a chapter. So, so one category is on improving energy efficiency, conservation, and fuel switching. And you can see uh, uh, in each of the chapters, we go through in a lot of detail what the current law is and how the law would need to change in order to uh, advance decarbonization. A uh, set of chapters on electricity decarbonization on the massive build out of wind and solar um, and, and, and geothermal and all the other technologies that are necessary. Uh, fuel decarbonization, moving away from, uh, from liquid and uh, gaseous fossil fuel uh, uses toward biofuel based uh, uses where that's still necessary. Carbon capture and negative emissions. Uh, the non-carbon dioxide climate pollutants that are also contributing to climate change and then cross-cutting approaches led by carbon pricing, but also technological innovation and other kinds of measures. So for each of these chapters, we have a whole set of, of recommendations, but we didn't want to just put the book on, on the shelf. We wanted to see how it could be implemented. And that uh, then led to the project of the model laws for deep decarbonization. Um, 
Richard Horsch, who had just retired as an environmental partner at the White and Case law firm, agreed to take on the leadership of our effort to recruit uh, law, law firms and lawyers working on a pro bono basis uh, to draft these model laws. So far, we have about 23 major law firms in, in the United States that have signed on to undertake this drafting. Um, uh, some of them don't want their names publicly announced, but, but most of them do. Uh, there's been a lot of enthusiasm among lawyers, partners, and associates in, in doing this, uh, this drafting. Uh, additionally, the law firm where I was a partner for many years, Arnold and Porter, has uh, founded a related project together with the, the Saban Center for Climate Change Law, which I had, the Renewable Energy Legal Defense Initiative, which provides pro bono legal assistance to community groups and others who want wind and solar and other renewables in their communities, but that are facing local opposition. So we've created this website model laws for deep decarbonization in the United States, on which we are posting both the laws that our team is drafting and also uh, a, a very large number of existing and model laws that others have written. And it's subcategorized uh, by chapter and index and so forth. So any member of Congress or of a state legislature or a city council or advocates before those entities who wants to uh, put forward a law on any of these very large number of topics can go to the website and find uh, model laws on these and also um, uh, resources on what the law is about and, and how that kind of law has worked if there's uh, some experience uh, in, in doing that. Um, so the, this is the website, lpdd.org. Uh, this is the the book, Legal Pathways to Deep, Decarboniz Deep Decarbonization, and also there's a link here to uh, download the, the free PDF of the summary volume. Uh, uh, this is me and my uh, co-editor, John Dernbach. Um, we really hope that lawyers who are watching this show will think about volunteering to uh, join in the drafting project. We need more lawyers to help draft these model laws. And anyone who is interested should contact uh, Richard Horsch. Uh, this is his email uh, address. Additionally, we want to make sure that we have good quality control. So we have a peer review process, uh, which is headed by Marcy Kahn, who recently retired as a justice of the New York State Supreme Court Appellate Division. Uh, so former Justice Kahn is heading up our peer review uh, project where we're looking for lawyers and others with expertise in particular areas to peer review the model laws that our team has drafted. Uh, we also have a public outreach program. We're trying to spread the word uh, to legislators around the country uh, to get, make them aware of these model laws and urge them to look at them for possible adaptation. Joseph Demona, who recently retired as general counsel of a corporate entity, is heading that. And finally, the Renewable Energy Legal Defense Initiative uh, is, is the principal staff person on that now is, is my uh, colleague, Hilary A. Doon at the Saban Center for Climate Change Law. Uh, so we very much hope that uh, many of you will uh, who are eager to use your legal skills to act on climate change will take advantage either of uh, these opportunities to draft the model laws or work with the Chancery Lane project in drafting model transactional clauses. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So we hear the power of pro bono on model laws and now I think it's a great time to draw in Yasmin Walji from uh, commercial law firm Hogan Lovells. Um, and Hogan Lovells has committed to sustainability and is holding it out itself out as a leader in this area. So could you share with us um, how your work, your pro bono work with um, the Chancery Lane project um, fits in that picture, please? 
I'd be delighted to, Ellie. Thank you so much for the invite and good morning from Hogan Lovells. It's a real privilege to be part and a sponsor of the Chancery Lane project and I hope that many of my New York colleagues will also be joining us. Um, as Ellie said, Hogan Lovells has made a commitment to sustainability. It's one of our strategic priorities, which means it sits at an equal priority of the other four strategic priorities of the business. So it's built into our strategy and it's accountability is accountable to the board. We as a firm are moving along the pathway to decarbonizing our operations. We're looking at business travel, the energy use of our buildings, but it goes much wider than that. It's supply chains and ultimately into our advisory work. We're doing it because we're responding to client demand and that client demand is coming from Europe, from international, but also from the United States. Um, we recently conducted a survey, which is a big survey of all of our clients and their commitments to um, sustainability. And 94% of our clients are committed in some way to sustainability, climate change for their specific industries. But it's also, as Ellie says, because we want to be seen as a leader in this um, space. Uh, the, and on a personal level, much like Matt said, um, I saw the clock in Times Square get some profile in the New York Times this morning, or was it yesterday? And it um, brought home to me the personal collection. We have very little time to get a grip on this issue and we need to do it and we need to do it fast. Um, we have a strong advisory practice in this area, so we need to be seen to be walking the talk. I'm the head of pro bono at in, I'm the international um, practice of the firm so I have the ability to guide the priorities of where we invest our pro bono time and we're looking for impactful projects that uses the time of our lawyers really well um, and I've looked at pro bono projects which reduce carbon um, I have two that I'm very proud of I'm going to tell you about the other one just quickly because I think it's really brilliant too we are working with snow change in Finland to provide pro bono advice on a small amount of finance to restore peatlands. So peat is um, dried and used as a fuel. What we're trying to do is rewild that area now through um, pro bono work and through some funding so it becomes a carbon sink and ultimately a biodiversity hotspot. And I'm told that even after six months there are some rare curlew birds that are now occupying that area. So that's in Arctic Finland and I can tell you more about that later. But the real jewel in our crown is the Chancery Lane project. It, we are incredibly proud to be a sponsor and to support Matt, Ellie and Ben in all of their work. Um, as has been said, as commercial lawyers, we are part of the economic ecosystem of business. And we need to be giving life to the aspirations of CEOs to reach net zero and to their commitments on that. We can't sit back and, and hope that this is going to happen. It needs our help. Following COVID, everyone is talking about the need to re rebuild back better to reset the economy um, but it is the way in which we do this as commercial lawyers that will matter and how we do that sustainably the chancery lawn project is our way as lawyers to engage um, we have within hogan lovell's several senior level partners who were a little bit initially reluctant to get involved but as they got involved they saw how their time could be used effectively by the Chancery Lane project they were really keen to help um, and now they have become our champions within the business so we have one from the infrastructure practice and one from the business uh, the banking practice they have been involved through the peer review um, efforts that go on with the playbooks and they found it incredibly rewarding and they've also had a ripple effect by taking what they've learned into their day-to-day -day practice which ultimately is where we're going to make the systems change that needs to happen on this. Um, it's having a great impact around the office there's a lot of energy a lot of interest um, young lawyers are particularly interested in getting involved in the slack groups and also what's interesting now is it's beginning to have an impact by allowing us to work with our clients. Deborah and I have had conversations, but we've had conversations with our other banking groups about how we can collaborate across the profession to, to really move the needle on this because that's what needs to happen. 
And I will end with a slightly sentimental thought. I was listening to Hamilton this morning because I really love the musical. And there was a, a line in one of the songs that says, how lucky we are to be alive at the moment because we have the ability to change history. I sincerely believe that the Chancery Lane project, because it attacks the plumbing and deals with the plumbing in our economic system, that is the way we change the world on this particular issue and as the song says in the greatest city in the world and given that this is being launched in New York I'm very happy to be part of it thank you Jasmine how do you follow up with uh, citing Hamilton to New York <laughs> terrific um how many plumbers do you have involved in the Chancery Lane project uh, we have about um I'd say about 15 to 20 plumbers, but the number is growing all the time. And what I like about it is the ability to carve out time that you can give. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you can break it down into units that are manageable for, mm -hmm. for the people involved. Thanks, Yasmin. Um, and thank you for answering, knowing that lawyers are plumbers. I love that analogy. Um, now I'd like to um, open up to Deborah Smith. So a slightly different perspective. We're now looking in house. So Deborah is a client of law firms and has her own client commercial teams as well. So Deborah at Goldman Sachs, why do you want to be involved in this project? How many lawyers do you have involved and what's in it for you? Uh, well, it's, it's interesting in thinking about this, I see um, our involvement almost in a, a, a three tier approach. I think at the, uh, at the highest level uh, within Goldman Sachs, we, are, we have dedicated teams that look at our vendor contracts from an ESG perspective. So this, uh, the Chancery Lane project gave us an opportunity then to get a seat at the table to kind of to, to relook at how we are approaching our own vendor contracts in this space and also making sure we're part of a dialogue going forward on best practices, et cetera. Um, down a level from that, I am the, the co-chair of our pro bono committee in EMEA uh, and this you know, as Yasmin said, it just, it takes all the boxes for a perfect pro bono opportunity. Um, I find particularly also in the in-house space. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's very easy for people to get involved in. Um, like Matt, most of our lawyers are not environmental lawyers, um, but most of them are passionate about the topic of, of, of the environment. So, but and I think it was interesting when we launched this project uh, to our legal team to get involved. I had a whole slew of responses coming back and saying, but I'm not an environmental lawyer. What would I possibly bring to the table? Um, and I just had to say to everybody, just go to the table and you'll see what you can bring to the table. Um, you bring market knowledge you bring to, you know, they, they, there are people involved who can help out on the environmental side. Our value add is knowing what the market is and how we can then best implement these model clauses into what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's an excellent project on, uh, for a pro bono, on a pro bono perspective. Um, and also it's been great, um, I think as Matt mentioned already, it's, it's been great in the COVID era as well. Um, the, the move to the virtual hackathons has been completely smooth. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's great when you're looking to see what type of pro bono projects you can offer your team, you know, in light of, of restrictions on, on meeting in person. Uh, this one was just such an easy, uh, an easy ask. Uh, and then finally, just to bring it down all the way to the personal level, being my third level, um, I am a capital markets lawyer by day, um, uh, but yet like so many others, passionate about the environment. Um, and, you know, it's just great to see how you can get involved in this space. Uh, it, the, the capital markets playbook has already been mentioned. It's exciting to think about, um, you know, aside from your standard green bond offering, uh, to think about how you can bring the environment into the non-green bond space, you know, how you can bring your, the environment into your classic IPO, your classic debt offering, your classic equity offering. 
Um, it's just, it's, it's an exciting opportunity and something that everybody really loves rolling their sleeves up for. Thanks, Deborah. I love how many times you said exciting in the final sentence. <laughs> and on that, um, Kathy, the Chancery Lane project has been exciting for Thompson Reuters practical law, I think, um, because you are a commercial business and you already produce contractual precedents for your subscribers. But you've been such a big supporter of the Chancery Lane project since the start. And those photos that we saw of um, in Matt's presentation, where we were still allowed in a room together, that was at your offices in London. Um, so you've been such a big supporter because it is exciting, I think. But is there more than that? Why is the Chancery Lane um, project, why are you involved in that at Practical Law? And um, what's the role that knowledge management providers can play in tackling climate change? Great, thanks, Ali. Um, I just want to apologize up front. I'm getting notices that my internet connection is unstable. Um, so hopefully it will maintain. Um, I think the um, practical laws involvement with the Chancery Lane project really starts actually with um, Becky Klisman, who is um, one of our senior legal editors in our environmental team. So maybe one of the few environmental lawyers um, and her passion um, for what lawyers can do to, to combat climate change um, is, is how we got um, uh, involved in the project. And um, things really took off from her bringing it to Thomson Reuters um, and specifically to practical law. And the reason why it took off, I think, um, stems from a couple of things. One, um, as others have talked about, um, it really aligns with Thomson Reuters corporate values and commitment saying, you know, as a company, our impact on the environment. And so we've got an environmental policy statement um, that includes maintaining carbon neutrality. People talked about changing um, travel policies. We've done that. Um, we've got green groups of, and lots of lawyers who work at Thomson Reuters. Um, so there's a lot of passion from the employee base um, and the support from, from the corporate um, social responsibility sense. Um, and in addition, I think when you're an information technology company um, and you part of that is the legal industry, you're part of the ecosystem. Um, and so we really just feel very connected um, to our, our clients, our customers, our, our colleagues. Um, bringing it to practical law uh, it really is part of our mission. So practical law's mission really is to take the law and demystify it um, and help lawyers practice more efficiently. So when you combine helping lawyers um, with the desire to, to um, have an impact on climate change um, with our you know, subject matter experts um, in different areas, environment and other areas, you really can see the um, potential and possibility to produce really um, powerful content to help. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. You saw the pictures, you mentioned them, Ellie. It's a great opportunity to collaborate with our colleagues and our customers. Um, I've heard it described um, as fun, collaborative, and impactful. And really, it doesn't get any better than that from a, you know, from a, a work experience. Um, I think the, you know, the bringing it back to knowledge management and what practical law does is it's commercial enterprise. Um, incorporating our learnings um, as experienced practitioners into our content, into developing our precedent is a, a core responsibility. Um, and so having an opportunity to um, take the learnings from participating in the Chancery Lane project um, and combining it with our precedent that we know our customers rely on already um, and expect us to do that heavy lift of staying on top of the law and being on the cutting edge and understanding where the market is going. Um, you know, again, it's, it's being a part of that whole ecosystem that aligns with, with all of our um, missions, our personal missions, as everyone has said, um, plus what we, what we want to do for our customers. Um, and so it, our, our um, editors in the UK have gotten involved um, in the peer review process for the climate contract playbook. Um, and we've started to take that and look at our precedent and start to incorporate it in the UK. So I'm super excited 
um, that this has traveled to our shores um, and that we can you know, put the weight of practical law in the US behind this as well. Um, I just think it's a, a tremendous opportunity to be a part of the change that, you know, that we all want to see. And um, at the beginning, I think we we're talking about what lawyers can do to influence change. And for us, if, you know, if our position as thought leaders in um, you know, commercial transaction space gives us a, a, an entry point for lawyers to start to understand how if they're not environmental lawyers, um, they, should, they can and should be creatively thinking and have unfettered thinking about the ways that they can incorporate um, and mitigate climate risk in their transactional work. Um, it's just exciting to be a part of that. Thanks, Kathy. I love how many times you said exciting then and fun and impactful. You've added some more adjectives. But I want to focus now on the content that you were speaking about. Um, and Matt's shared with us, with the launch of the third climate contract playbook, we now have about 50 clauses. Um, but they were drafted predominantly by UK-based lawyers um, with London governing law. Um, so what are your thoughts on the applicability of those clauses? And I might ask Kathy and then Deborah, if you could um, uh, comment on this as well. So we've got clauses for the US, for London, um, law of England and Wales. Um, how applicable that will they be for our New York lawyers? I think that will really vary by practice area, um, like a lot of areas of the law. Um, but I think the real um, impact will be uh, sort of the creative spark has already been done. So there's, you're not starting from scratch. So I think um, Yasmin talked about lawyers not understanding where they would fit in. Um, and so literally having a playbook to start from to say, yes, this is applicable. No, this isn't. Here's how we'd have to adapt it um, and change it to reflect our um, transactional practices or our area of the law. Um, I think it just you know, it enables people to jump in with both feet and not sort of have the first hour of the hackathon be, I don't know, what do you think? Um, and so I think it just gets us off to a really great start. Thanks, Kathy. Deborah, what are your thoughts on that? I, I'd echo that. I think, I think there's a bit of translation work to do. Um, yeah, I, I'm a US qualified lawyer, although I work in London. Um, so I am constantly translating from English to English. Uh, and I think that the, the, the process probably needs to be done, but you know, as Kathy said, it's, uh, it, it, it's an in, kind of an inspirational spark um, to see what has been done here, uh, to think about how that can then be applied in the US. Um, but also I think, you know, it, when we were looking at the capital markets playbook, you know, we were thinking about things even beyond the pure contract side of things, but also, you know, looking at standardized due diligence questions, standardized management questionnaires or in the environmental space. So things like that are probably easier to translate. Those that are kind of legal specific uh, will have a bit more of a translation exercise. Uh, but then it's also, it's also thinking about the different market practices as well, which will have to be taken into account as well. It's not just the legal side, but the market in the US is quite different and what's the best way to approach it? What's the best way to tackle that? These are all things that will need to be addressed. That's all um, fantastic insights from people who've been thinking about this um, for so long already. So thank you for sharing those with the audience. Um, I'd now like to pick up a question in the Q&A. Oh, Professor Gerard, did you want to jump in there? Oh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> um, a question in the Q&A. Um, so this one, Yasmin, I'm going to ask you to jump in first. So if clients are resistant to taking steps to proactively align their business models and strategies with net zero, do lawyers have a role in pointing the way beyond just in advising on the client's specific instructions? So I suppose what we're asking is, is this entirely client-led or should it be lawyer-led or is there a bit of both? What, what do you think with your Hogan Lovells practice? So ultimately, we are seen as trusted advisors to our clients. And with that in mind, it is our role to point out the challenges that they are going to face and how to deal with them. So whilst we need to be respectful of their particular views, I think it is important and to draw their attention or at least discuss with them the issues that are going to arise for that particular transaction and climate change and the situation that we have is here with us now. And 
in some ways, my view is if we don't do this, if we don't open up the discussion and try to, we're on the verge of not carrying out our acting in the client's best interests, which is our professional obligation. And I would say you may go into a position where you're actually being negligent by not at least exploring these issues. So it is challenging. No one's saying that you need to be an activist around this, but I think it is a subject that we need to raise and be prepared to raise with clients who we think are resistant, but actually when you start talking to them and exploring it, there are opportunities for making progress on this. I'd be interested in others' views. I might, I'm Deborah. Well, I might just point and out, um, I, I think Ellie, you mentioned in the introduction that um, I'm also a founder of a, a group here in the UK called the In-House Pro Bono Group. Um, and we are a group of in-house lawyers, um, and we've been we've been promoting the Chancery Lane project within within this group, uh, and have also seen great take up on this side. Uh, so this, you know, from the client side as well, um, you know, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of interest here, uh, and it, you know, the conversation is starting. And you know, Matt, Ellie, you could probably speak more to 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 numbers, but uh, you know, at the hackathons, there. There have been plenty of, of you know, investment banks, corporates uh, involved in the hackathons. So you know, we are seeing that they want to be part of the dialogue as well, which I think is a helpful, a helpful element here. Thanks, Deborah. Mark, would you have thoughts from the US? Uh, yeah, I'd like to pick up on Yasmin's uh, suggestion and give a concrete example in the US where it's important for lawyers to point out climate change issues to clients in doing real estate transactions, it's customary to look at the FEMA flood maps to see whether a particular uh, parcel is within a hundred year flood zone. But these FEMA flood maps are completely backward looking. They don't look at anticipated uh, sea level rise caused by climate change. Uh, so a uh, lawyer representing a client in a real estate transaction uh, really needs to make sure that the client is not looking at only at the official flood maps, but is looking at some other resources that have become available. I'll put something in the chat about that to find those resources. But this is this is one uh, concrete example where we really, as as lawyers, need to be making sure that our clients are aware of these kinds of issues. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's absolutely right. And we actually did some drafting in the first edition of the, the Climate Playbook to cover that off um, from a commercial advisory perspective. And I always, I always answer this question with, with a bit of a story because, uh, and forgive me if you've heard this story before, but I was reading my daughter a, a book one night. Um, and in that book, it's called You Choose. You get to explore what you want to do in life. And you get to come up with ideas about where you want to go, where you want to, who you want to visit um, and things like that. And one of the sections is about what you want to do in your career when you grow up. So my daughter, who was five at the time, uh, was sat with me and I said to her pretty naively, do you want to be a lawyer like daddy? Uh, to which she replied in that way that only kids do, what do they do? And so I thought for a minute and I said, well, lawyers help people. Uh, and she looked at me and went, ah, oh, daddy helps people. And then you have that sinking feeling because you don't want to lie to your kids. And so I scrambled and said, well, no, daddy helps put deals together and helps write the contracts that, you know, govern the obligations and risks for the parties. She just glazes over. And I thought, well, why can't I explain what I do to uh, my five-year-old? I can explain what a gardener and even an architect and a builder, any, any of these key essential workers can do. So you have that kind of sinking feeling, but I've come full circle on it. And it's, a, it's about purpose and about taking that personal responsibility. Um, and so that's how I always answer that question about whether we should or not. It's, it's up to the person to take the responsibility as a professional um, to do what is right for both their business, their client and the climate. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to zoom out a little bit because we're getting some questions in around um, litigation and I'd like to, um, Lord Carnworth, you introduced the concept of, well, this is how much legislation can achieve and this is how much litigation can achieve. And then we've got 
the role for commercial law and contracting. So we've got a question around how do we use the law to hold the government to account on net zero? Did you want to kind of say something about that or place that idea of accountability and litigation in the context of also passing model laws and these contractual things? How do you see it all fitting in together in the UK? And then also what can we learn from that in the US? And I'll then open it up particularly to Michael for the US perspective. You're on mute. mute is that all right okay, we've got you now thank you thank you um I, I mean there was one question about government accountability and i think that's rather different to what we've been discussing here i mean government accountability in, in my country is very much about the climate change act 2008 um i saw one of the questioners said well the government doesn't take any notice of it but i i think that's a bit unfair because the great thing about the Climate Change Act is that it actually has a very strong framework. You get the Climate Change Committee, which is generally independent and expert, which makes its, its, it gives its advice and its proposals and its latest report, a strong report which came out a couple of months ago. And the government then has an obligation to respond to that and not just respond to it, but to say what are its plans for achieving the its objectives over the next 10 15 years and the government has recently has been well it's, it, there's apparently going to be a white paper fairly soon which will deal with that and i think that actually well we'll see what comes out of it but ultimately if the government doesn't come up with something which is credible and effective then i'd be very surprised if someone doesn't take them to court um i mean I, I, people may have been slightly misled by the Heathrow decision recently where the Court of Appeal held the government's plans for a third runway were unlawful because they didn't take sufficient account of the Paris Agreement. But that's really about the relationship between the Paris Agreement and the Climate Change Act and it's going to the Supreme Court so I wouldn't comment on that. But generally I think the Climate Change Act is strong and there are now, and Michael Gerald will talk about the New York Act, they're very strong frameworks. Um, and, you know, if you've got that strong legal framework, well, then if you've got a, an established court system, as we have in most of the countries we're talking about, then they can give effect to it. The, um, I think this, what I, I, I'm so interested by, by the Your Project, is it's sort of coming into a different level, which hopefully is not about litigation at all. Uh, it's not about legislation. It's simply about saying, well, these are the basic building blocks, you know, the plumbing which uh, enables the commercial world to carry on. And that's got to be plumbed in a way which recognizes these issues. And so I see them very much as complementary. Uh, I don't know whether others agree. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Conwith. Uh, Michael, the plumbing in the US, how do, does these, um, do the contracts that, for climate solutions and also the model laws fit in with the, um, the climate litigation that's going on? Uh, so climate litigation has been central to action on climate change in the United States in the absence of any congressional action. It was the 1987 decision of the Supreme Court in Massachusetts versus EPA that made clear that EPA does have the authority to use the old Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse gases. We are frankly very nervous that with what's happening with the U.S. Supreme Court, that decision may be in some jeopardy or at least uh, aspects of it. Over the last three and a half years, uh, litigation has played a central role in trying to hold back the efforts by the Trump administration to rescind or weaken many of the environmental statutes. Uh, depending on what happens in the next election, uh, there's a very binary choice uh, with what the direction of, of climate change. If, um, if Vice President Biden wins, I think we will see a lot of uh, strong actions by the administration, which will all be challenged in court, as everything that President Obama did was challenged in court. 
if President Trump is reelected, then we'll see a lot of movement in the other direction. And I think more of the locus of activity for positive climate action will be at the state and city level. Uh, New York State has a very important, strong new climate law uh, that is going to uh, really have a, a major impact. In order for it all to work, we really need these transactions to work. We really need uh, we need this massive amount of wind and solar and efficiency. Uh, we need the supply chains affected. We need all of the things and the financing that, that these transactional agreements that the Chancery Lane project is working on will help facilitate. Thanks, Michael. So it's about the transactions. And I've got a question for Deborah um, on Goldman Sachs. So a question from Vanessa at UCL. And so she's asking, in what way would the legal team at Goldman's amend or add to a vendor contract to make it greener? And what other kind of non-green bond um, uh, ways are you engaging with the Chancery Lane project? So could you share some examples of what you've done so far? I think you've got, and also how many lawyers do, in Goldman do you have working on the Chancery Lane project? Uh, so numbers wise, I think we've got um, in London, we've got about 10 lawyers working on the project. Um, and I think with the uh, with the introduction of uh, looking at capital markets, I think that will probably uh, go up a little bit uh, as well. But uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what ways we could uh, t types of clauses, etc. Aside from the um, the green bond context, I think you know. There are a lot of different ways you can look at it. Um, you know, your standard on a capital market side, your standard, um, you know, your standard purchase agreement, etc. You usually get different uh, representations and undertakings from management. Um, you know, we could, it, we've been looking and thinking about those and thinking about um, thinking about uh, you know, whether we could introduce. Uh, more, I, you know, we already do have, um, we typically do address environmental issues, but ways we can make those more robust, uh, and ways we can make them, you know, potentially forward looking, um, you know, it's, it's very much a brainstorming at this stage. Um, but, you know, as I, I, another way I've already mentioned is making sure that as part of our due diligence process, when looking at clients, uh, making sure that we really are digging deeply into environmental issues, uh, existing policies, um, but then also looking forward uh, as we look to go, you know, towards carbon, uh, towards carbon zero, uh, making sure that our, our due diligence is addressing those issues as well. Um, I think, you know, at the moment it's, um, it's a brainstorming phase, um, but I think there, I think the interesting thing about particularly the in-house side is is seeing that, that there are so many different ways that we could we could work this in and it's just really sitting down at a table and brainstorming possible solutions here um I I, hopefully that, that addresses the yeah the no i love there. I love how many times you said brainstorming because that was something that, um, particularly in the room at the first hackathon, that just the magic of having lawyers use post-it notes and A3 pieces of paper and thinking really differently. And that's something that's really come up from all of our speakers today around imagination, creativity as well. So the opportunities there. Um, I've got a bit of a curly question um, that's come in. Uh, but I think that Matt might have an answer for this one. So it's around the relationship between the legal world and protest movements. And so where should that go? If you have a lawyer that, that says, I'm not arrestable, um, we're thinking around like XR, the school strikes for climate. If your lawyer says, I'm not arrestable, what should they do? And so what should the legal profession do in that case? Uh, yeah, nice, nice one. Um, I think, um, as I said during my, my opening piece, this is about positive collaboration in a politically and professionally neutral way. I think, um, you know, activism can be such a divisive thing. And, I, and what I want to do is bring everybody together to focus on this. So um, I think it's a very personal choice and I think it's up to the individual. But I hear these great stories and um, you know, some of Philip Brown is, is a great example where uh, a partner at a law firm was telling me a story um, about his uh, teenage son who went on a protest 
and turned around to his dad and said, dad, what are you doing? And as a partner at a major international law firm, he thought, well, I can't go on a protest and get arrested. So what, what can I do? And actually what you can do is you can use your transactional legal skills to make a difference in the day job. And I think that is the difference between this project and activism and protesting, which has its place in the world. I'm, I'm not judging what other people do, but we are just completely neutral on it. And we try and keep the conversation as positive as possible. And that's why you will never hear me talk about climate litigation. It has its place. But I want to try and create the climate solutions and focus on the positivity. Thanks, Matt. And just while I've got you a quick follow up, um, for Chancellor Lane's specific question, how do we push the legal space to expand environmental law beyond the few exclusive and elitist big nonprofits and narrow spaces pro bono within firms? So particularly, we've got Yasmin here from Hogan Lovells, but that's a very, very big firm. Could you share around the, um, the smaller firms that are being involved and also not environmental lawyers? So what's the scope of the people that we've got involved in this project? Sorry, is that for me? Yes, yeah, yeah. so, um, as, as I said, um, uh, we did an impact survey last year and 95% of our participants said they were not uh, environmental lawyers. And I think that's one of the key kind of premises of what we were trying to achieve is that we were trying to make it more mainstream. So get your corporate lawyers to put it in your due diligence, get your commercial lawyers to put it in the supply contracts, real estate, with your green leases uh, and your you know flood assessed um, report on titles um, capital markets kind of be in the disclosure exercise so that you get to focus on those four key elements that michael was talking about electrification removal of carbon energy efficiency are you asking the questions in your due diligence questionnaire in that way and that doesn't take an environmental lawyer the environmental lawyers have been brilliant they've been all over this for the last 20 years and i'm guilty of not listening to them as much as I should. Um, but now is the time for mainstream where climate should be on the agenda for every commercial transaction and every commercial lawyer, no matter what their practice area. And what's really exciting is the latest edition of the playbook launched today, nice plug, um, also includes a lot of work about um, greener arbitrations and greener litigation and actually driving green and climate behavior through the disputes we have and again, this is aligned with the business of law. So I think it's whatever practice area you are in, there is an opportunity to participate. And that is unlike other pro bono um, projects. And I call this pro bono, but not as you know it. It's almost beyond pro bono um, because we're not advising any specific person. We're not advising a beneficiary. We're kind of coming together and, and pro providing kind of this knowledge philanthropy that goes way beyond pro bono. We're using our, our legal skills for free to d achieve it. So I always say it's pro bono, but not as you know it. Um, and I'm a bit of a Star Trek fan, so that's... that's Yasmin, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I would, I would add that this issue, the, the, our, the transition that we are going to have to face as society is enormous. It will affect every industry sector area, every geographic regional area, every, every practice area needs to start thinking about how this issue is going to affect their practice. It could be pensions, it could be infrastructure, it could be real estate. It is going to, it's one of those issues, much like gender equality, gender diversity, that will affect every aspect of their lives, our lives and should do. Picking up on what Yasmin was saying, bringing in some other kinds of social issues there, I'd like to throw it up to you. We've got a lot of corporate lawyers on the call here, but we know that, and we're talking about um, this, the alignment of planets and profits and business. We know that climate change um, is already and is going to impact the most vulnerable communities um, the most, and it's going to compound on existing inequalities, particularly around racial injustice and poverty. Um, and that's across countries, but also within countries like the US. Um, so I'm wondering, is there an opportunity for corporate lawyers to be responding to climate change 
as well as playing a part in other vitally important co um, causes like responding to the Black Lives Matter movement or in the context of climate change, the just transition. So we've got a question around that as well. So I'm going to open it up to Professor Gerard if you wanted to say something around the intersections of climate and other issues. So addressing climate change will involve a Massive, massive amount of construction and infrastructure work and retrofitting of buildings, which are going to be enormous opportunities for job creation. And you mentioned just transition, and that's exactly right. As we move away from fossil fuel industries, we need to protect the workers who are displaced by that. It's not their fault uh, that they were working in this area. And we want to make sure that uh, that many of these jobs are in uh, historically disadvantaged communities that we provide the job training and other opportunities for, for those to happen. So there's a, a lot of attention being devoted and more should be devoted to how to have the, the, the multiple uh, benefits of, of job creation, of public health improvements, because if we're not burning fossil fuels, we don't have as much air pollution and doing these, these other things that both help reduce climate change and, and reduce economic inequality and reduce the disproportionate impact that environmental hazards have on poor people. Does anyone else want to jump in there? Annie, could I go back a step? Um, on this, you, someone asked a question about the relationship between protest movements and the law and I'm, I'm very interested in this. I, 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 a couple of years ago, the Extinction Rebellion had a protest and they actually occupied Parliament Square, which, uh, as many of you know, is actually where the, our Supreme Court is situated. And they put up an office which was just outside the main entrance to, to the court. Um, it was decided not to sort of move them on because they were, they were you know, it was very polite. But I wonder sort of what my message would be to them. I didn't actually engage in a debate because I thought that might not be appropriate. But it seemed to me that there was, you know, it's it very important what they were doing. And it was very important to get it to the heart of the, our constitutional centre, which is Westminster. But equally, I would have said to them, please don't give up on the law. And I think what we've been talking about, and indeed what Matthew was saying, is we really, as lawyers, we've got to show that we're not giving, you know, that they shouldn't give on, that we are delivering. And I would have point, I mean, although we haven't had any climate change cases in the Supreme Court yet, we had one on air pollution in London where we were, we, we made a fairly strong order requiring the government to comply with the um, mandatory pollution, air pollution limits. Uh, um, and I think, you know, I've talked to, it was brought by Client Earth and I've talked to them about its effect. And it's been actually very important, influential not only in improving things in this country, but actually it's been a model in other countries across, across Europe. And so I think, you know, at the moment, as I said, we're waiting to see how the government's going to respond to the latest climate committee report. But I, I, I would stick with the law. I mean, by all means, campaign to make sure the law is enforced, but don't give up on the law. Thank you, Lord Khan, with a very powerful message. Don't give up on the law. Um, we've got another Q&A question and Kathy, I'm going to open this up to you first off. So it's around funding and so it's asking for um, uh, how are we getting these measures passed with laws but contracts. And so the Chancery Lane project, we use the power of pro bono. So the vast majority of our work is lawyers giving us their time, their energy, their expertise, their immense brains. I say that I'm a lawyer, I'm very biased, um, but they're so generous in giving their time to the project. And we also have uh, sponsorship in kind from Practical Law, you give us so much support. So um, how is it that you're, so Thomson Reuters, Practical Law providing in-kind support for a pro bono project. How are you able to do that, particularly in the US when it's um, climate change is seen as politically divisive? Did you want to comment on this kind of corporate in-kind sponsorship for a climate change focused activity? Sure, um, I, I think first of all, um, several speakers have talked about this already. It's sort of taking it out of the political context. Um, and, and there's already, like I had mentioned, um, you know, 
corporate buy-in for environmentally sound policy. Um, so that we didn't, we don't have to overcome any sort of institutional um, bias in in a direction. Um, the other, the other part I think um, just comes from the. Um, you know, we, we fund lots of ways for our editors to connect with customers um, and colleagues in, so that we stay on top of, it's a core function of the product that we sell. Um, so there is, a, there is a commercial aspect to it. Um, but I think the other part that really gets to the, the heart of, of the Thomson Reuters company and practical law is um, we have a lot of smart lawyers that work for us and pro bono, um, is built in to our employee benefits. And so we actually give paid time leave um, for pro bono activities. So it's encouraged, it's part of our makeup. Um, and when all those stars align, um, you know, it, it's, um, it's easier to find um, support in the business for that. I'll, you know, in any, any time, like the, the, we're challenged like any other business during this time period, um, but something like a virtual, conference becomes an easier sell to get sponsorship for. Um, and so I think it just, you know, it's the, it's the right mission at the right time with the right employee base. So mm -hmm. it, you know, from that perspective, um, sometimes it's hard to get to the decision maker in a company this size um, who actually signs the checks. But, but other than that, there's a lot of enthusiasm um, and support behind it. So it makes that part um, a bit easier. Thanks, Kathy. Michael, did you want to jump in? Just wanted to address that in the context of the Model Laws Project. Uh, many big law firms, of course, represent fossil fuel companies. And so those firms are not going to want to get involved in drafting the model laws that are directly aimed at fossil fuel companies. But very often they're happy to get involved in drafting laws about building wind farms or improving the energy efficiency in appliances. There are lots of areas that do not have the same kind of uh, client sensitivities. And so we have found that a broad array of, of uh, corporate law firms are happy to get involved in drafting certain kinds of model laws for us. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right, Michael, but I, th I think the other thing I'm seeing is a change in direction in, in corporate PLCs. So we've got Shell and BP both having big net zero targets. They're going to have, I don't know how many contracts to help that transition. So um, I appreciate the point, but I think in the UK it's slightly gone a bit further already, um, and so there's this this huge corporate alignment with with climate and uh, environmental action. Anyway, thanks, Matt. And while I've got you off mute, uh, could I ask that you? So at the Chancellor Land Project, we don't do an event, we don't do anything unless we think that it will have impact, and so for an event, that's a call to action. So I hope that over the last hour or so, our speakers have really excited our audience. We, uh, we think we've got this really exciting thing and we want you to join us. So Matt, could I ask you to let our audience know how we can get involved? Yep, just one second while I share my screen. Um, uh, thanks, Ellie, and that was um, a really great discussion. Uh, and hopefully you'll agree that it's, it's kind of a, a different kind of pro bono project. Um, and I think what we've already, some of the things I heard is, is we don't have all the answers and we never profess to have that. Um, you, the lawyers and the firms and the in-house teams, you have, the, you are the experts in your practice areas, your industries and jurisdictions. And that's where we need you as the individuals and the firms and the organizations to come together and collaborate and collaboration with what are normally competitors is not really in our nature as lawyers, but I think nature requires it in this case. And so I would ask you to get involved in the big hack which launches today. So you can get involved by signing up via our website and get involved in the next few months of virtual hacking process where we're going to be inventing some new clauses. We're going to be doing the drafting, reviewing and editing, and as we said earlier, that naturalization to your jurisdiction um, and your market practices. The other thing I would ask you to do is tell our story. Tell the story of how the legal profession is acting in a positive way and so that we don't give up on the law, to, to use Robert's words. You can tell that story internally to your organization, to your networks, and I, I know a lot of firms are using it as a way to engage their clients in a collaborative way. 
And then I would ask you to join the climate suite. This is a new concept we're putting around for uh, COP26, where we're saying to um, lawyers that advise boards and in-house general counsel and uh, legal directors uh, to join the climate suite, this climate equipped board. These are the people that will drive a top-down approach within organizations and cascade that uh, net zero or climate change element into every facet of a business. We also ask you to change precedents and use clauses, take them off the pages and into your practice. You will use your skill and judgment. You know when to use them. You know which clients will want them and you know how best to deploy and negotiate them. That is up to you. So for my second big announcement of today, I'm delighted to announce the big hack, but even more delighted to announce uh, our brilliant new online hacking um, system, which is available via our events page. This will help coordinate, collaborate, and codify all your generous pro bono time. And this is really important as we move to this kind of next international um, uh, level of our strategy. It has this seven stage process to facilitate the drafting. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but it's designed to break things down, to allow for that collaboration to happen at different points of time, uh, to ensure the quality and importantly, protect your inbox. We know we're all busy as lawyers and it's difficult to get out of the inbox and this system allows it to break down into piecemeal elements so that you can bring your expertise when it's required at the right point to have the biggest impact. The central to this process, as you'll see, is something that's a bit alien to lawyers, which is the origin story. And origin stories is our way of describing and translating the idea um, and the impact it will create. So like any superhero, it explains the genesis of the power and the impact it will make. Um, and I look forward to collaborating with you on this, this site um, in the not too distant future, but I'll finish by saying that 2020 will go down as one of the worst years ever on record. Understandably, it has not been the year of clarity and action on climate change that many of us had hoped. And I think the path of the next generation seems less clear than ever. But history reminds us that with shared purpose and working together, we can navigate uncertainty, whatever its nature. As such, I am positive that the legal profession can and will help to mitigate climate change through collaborative drafting. To put it simply, if we change the precedent, we will change the world. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. That's not very ambitious at all. Um, so in the last two minutes, I'd like to thank you. So we're closing up now so you can make your next meeting. Thank you so much to our speakers today. We've had Lord Khan with Matt Gingell, uh, Professor Michael Gerard, Deborah Smith, Yasmin Walji, Kathy DeFilia. Just a fantastic conversation. You knew that they had big brains before this, but they also have big hearts and they're putting them all to uh, addressing the climate crisis. So please do join us before that, uh, join us on that journey. Um, the Chancellor Land Project team, obviously there's a big team behind every all the work that we do. We've got hundreds of lawyers in our community giving up their time, so thank you for that. But a big particularly, particular welcome and thank you to Ben Metz, Becky Clisman, Jenny Ramos, Matilda Graham and Alicia Lawson for this event. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that you feel excited by this immense opportunity that we have as lawyers to tackle climate change. Lawyers are not going to save the world but we can't do it without lawyers. So I'm gonna take a leaf out of Yasmin's book and finished with a Hamilton quote. If, um, if you want to be in the room where it happens, we've got a room, it's not the room, but it's a room and it's happening. So please come and join us, sign up to get involved on the website. Thank you everyone.